Well, good morning, all. Uh, thank you for um, taking the time to join us today. Um, my name is Bob Henry. I'm, I'm a federal system engineer with Fidelis Cybersecurity, and I'm going to take you through um, our platform capabilities with regard to Zero Trust today. Uh, appreciate everybody's time and um, look forward to, uh, to doing this. Let me just cancel my video so that we don't have any um, interruptions and it's a little less distracting. Okay, so moving forward, um, a little bit of, of background about Fidelis. Um, we are a, a US-based company. Uh, we're based in Bethesda, Maryland. Our development is done in uh, the United States. Um, we uh, have had a, a long history, uh, having been founded by a retired Marine in uh, the 2002 timeframe. Um, and uh, obviously our, our secret uh, or our, our bread and butter uh, at that time was in- I uh, do, do me a favor, send- The- um, DLP, uh, network-based DLP um, uh, solution. And then along about uh, 2015, we picked up uh, our endpoint product uh, and put a, an EDR capability in place that allows us to tie together uh, network and um, endpoint events simultaneously and automatically, which is very important to uh, being able to address cyber threats at cyber speed, which we'll have to talk a lot about today. Um, along about 2017, uh, continue to innovate the product uh, and bring them together. And we acquired a, a, the third leg in our um, stool of products, if you will. Um, and uh, that is uh, our deception capability. Um, it's really a game changing uh, technology. And we're going to talk to that today and then get into it, into the weeds um, and explain how that's all going to fit into this uh, architecture going forward for, for customers. Um, and uh, today that we have this uh, moniker uh, called Elevate, which is our platform. And uh, I'll have more to say about that um, in just a minute. So just a little bit of background to get us started. Um, where we've been uh, in terms of um, the last 20-ish uh, years. Bob, I'm sorry, I think we lost your audio. Yep, we did, got it now. Um, <clears throat> so anyway, uh, we started, uh, uh, we have a lot of uh, capability within uh, within the product space, um, and our customer penetration goes across um, uh, various vertical markets as well as uh, a large footprint within the U.S. government space. Um, for uh, permission reasons, I guess, let's say it that way, uh, we did not show the uh, logos of the various customers that we have, but uh, I can share that, uh, that Air Force um, is probably one of our longest uh, running customers, and DISA is certainly... Um, a large customer of ours. So um, we were able to work in the smallest agencies and smallest um, uh, small business markets on the commercial side, as well as um, the largest uh, federal deployments um, of networking uh, in the globe, on the globe. What the uh, Elevate platform looks like, this is kind of a pseudo logical architecture slide. Um, and at the, I'll just start at the bottom here. And basically what we provide is a sensing capability, right? So we have network sensors, we have endpoint agents, uh, and we have uh, deception decoys. Um, those are the, the, the places where the heavy lifting gets done, uh, kind of at the, the point of attack uh, for the adversary uh, and where we generate um, a, a lot of capability. And we're gonna have a lot to talk about today. So I'm hoping you will bear with me as I go through that. Uh, on the network side, um, it's our largest running product, as I said, it stated earlier. And clearly, um, you know, it's capable of being deployed into every size environment that there is. So we've done things with in uh, low swap space. Uh, we've done things uh, at, the, at the, you know, the 100 gigabit per second uh, range. Uh, and we do everything we do with the network sensing is, uh, is you know, at cyber speed. Um, so that's really where the secret sauce is. And we'll get into that uh, with a further discussion down the road. But whether you're in the cloud or on-prem, you're in a Humvee, um, we have form factor and incident response team, cyber protection team, capable uh, uh, resource. Uh, we have form factors and capability VMs uh, and other um, uh, uh, capabilities in the cloud are obviously VDH and um, as well as, uh, or VHD, sorry, and uh, AMI for those particular environments. Um, and, uh, and the variety of sensing technology, which I'll describe later. Uh, that sensing technology um, is going to uh, look at all ports, all protocols on the wire at the same time. And it's also um, doing some other things that we've added to the product over time, especially with the deception acquisition to bring in a cyber terrain piece. All of that um, heavy decoding of, of network traffic uh, generates a tremendous amount of metadata um, that is uh, collected and retained for analysis ongoing at, retrospectively uh, and uh, analytically. And 
all of that data can be shared. So um, you'll see seam sore here, and I'll have another architecture slide on this later, but uh, everything we're doing at the heavy lifting layer on the sensor side is shareable. So we're not uh, a, uh, an enclosed proprietary system. We're de deliberately designed to, to interoperate uh, within architectural constructs uh, to do the cyber defense mission. Uh, the endpoint agents uh, are, you know, the typical business operating system um, capabilities. Uh, our endpoint agent also uh, is looking at all I.O. on the box, um, is basically a, uh, an EDR platform. It is script based, so any script you can generate, purchase, uh, steal from GitHub, if you will, uh, you're, you're welcome to use those um, in the process of prosecuting your um, detection and response capabilities for um, securing your endpoints. Uh, in the architecture. And again, lots of metadata goes to that, and we'll talk to that uh, and demonstrate that today. Deception. So the deception decoys is basically, if you can think of it as a single server uh, that can run literally thousands of systems simultaneously and, and set them up in a couple of minutes. Um, it's very agile. It's very, uh, you know, I call it the high speed load drag in terms of deployment and resources uh, capabilities, right? So um, just a, a server uh, can really change the game with the adversary. Uh, and from a background perspective, I spent um, seven years working uh, with the Department of Defense as a contractor in the Pentagon, and one of our, our key tenants was, you know, reduce the attack surface, right? That was a key thing when we've been trying to do that a long time. Um, and I think what we have to keep in mind uh, as we go forward in, in looking at architecture is, wouldn't it be great if it wouldn't be so easy for the adversary to, to pick us off, um, right? As soon as they get through the defenses we put in place, um, they always hit a real endpoint, they always hit a real target. Um, it may not be the most opportune target, but it's enough to get them in the door and per establish persistence uh, and make lateral uh, movement. That's the way the game is played. Um, so wouldn't it be nice if we could uh, kind of trip them up on that? And so that's where deception comes in. We actually expand the attack surface, give them targets of interest and opportunity that can either um, deter them that can uh, or uh, contain them, right, and provide um, a, uh, a deferred, you know, a detour, if you will, that takes them off track and slows them down. Uh, at the same time, it is an early warning system for cyber defenders, right? It's not a noisy capability. As soon as uh, activity is seen in a deception environment, we're running emulated systems, so they're not real OSs at the, at the base layer. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, uh, somebody's engaging with those, they're doing so because um, they believe that they can achieve their objectives. And um, the good news is they've, they've uh, exposed their location within the cyber terrain to us, which is huge. Um, and we'll get into that today with the demo. Uh, at the green layer, that's where the intelligence plugs in. So the, the cyber uh, analyst plugs in, the data science plugs in. We have machine learning and AI uh, models uh, running uh, within that green layer to do analytic uh, assessment of activity. Uh, our threat intelligence, uh, your threat intelligence, um, Joe's threat intelligence that he's curated from surfing the dark web, whatever it is, um, can be consumed there. Uh, completely open architecture. So whatever you have, we can take in and we're going to apply it at both layers, right? We're going to apply it at the sensor layer and the green layer simultaneously. So we can tell you, uh, you know what? Um, it's great that this zero day was released by US CERT, the FBI, whomever gave you that threat intelligence today. Um, unfortunately, your zero day was last Tuesday, right? And so um, here's all the details you need, and here's the impact uh, that it's had so far in having detonated in your environment. And so uh, now you have uh, your remediation targets and your response actions uh, can be easily defined. You didn't have to roll a truck to a site. You didn't have to pull log files. You didn't have to rerun PCAP. Um, you can do all of this uh, in real time. Our metadata is um, you know, considerably less overhead from a resource perspective. Uh, than say PCAP solution, but we do integrate uh, with a PCAP solution as well. So if you've got that and uh, you want to tie our metadata into the PCAPs, we'll pull uh, those artifacts together and really um, to do a forensic triage of an, of an, of an existing event um, or an emerging event. Uh, those capabilities are built into the product today, so you can make that happen. Uh, up in the left-hand corner, just to cover the architecture, um, you know, we have our own sandbox capability. Um, so we're doing that our detection. We have uh, four different ways to do that on the network product, uh, a few different ways on the endpoint product, and the deception product participates. So if the adversary uploads malware into, uh, as it tries to use a uh, decoy as a pivot point, um, we will detect that. One uh, saved thing thought on uh, deception is that we are uh, um, an emulation based capability at the front end, which is important to um, 
save time and resources. However, uh, customers do have requirements uh, to, to take it a next step further or who want to do a little bit more um, uh, nuanced deception capability and they want to run copies of their existing uh, systems. Um, and so you can think of it as like I, the DMV and I want to you know, make sure that if the adversary is looking for a way to create free licenses or generate uh, fake licenses using my systems, right? What I want to do is I want to give them the opportunity to uh, play around in ostensibly what is the old honeypot technology. And we'll get into that. Um, but at the end of the day, we can run what we call real OS decoys right alongside um, your uh, emulated decoys and give you that uh, complete spectrum, robust spectrum of capability, depending on what your mission set is and how you are postured from a cybersecurity posture perspective. So, um, so I think that's really important. There is built in seam sort uh, into our, um, our architecture natively. However, again, uh, we can export any of the data that we're generating uh, into those environments and we'll demonstrate that today. So hopefully that gives everybody an understanding uh, of how we fit and, and what we do. Um, and uh, there's one more thing that's happened uh, since uh, we started putting this together. Um, and I'll get to that. <laughs> I, I, I reordered my slides and just found it. Um, so we'll talk about network first. So uh, we're going to detect and respond to threats, prevent data loss, DLP, right? So um, the biggest thing that we bring to the table when it comes to zero trust at the onset is the data loss prevention piece. It's under the data pillar. Uh, it's a no-brainer. Um, and we do that across harmonize that across various attack vectors um, in the DLP space. And we'll talk about those later. But um, the other thing that we're bringing is cyber uh, asset mapping and terrain, right? You have to understand what's in your environment, how they communicate, who's talking to who, when, and that terrain is dynamic now, right? It's, it's cloud-based, it's dynamic, it scales, it comes up, it comes down, systems come in and come out. Our, even our workforce doesn't just show up for work anymore. They're coming in from all different vectors, right? So we have to be able to see the cyber terrain. We have to have access to it in real time. And we have to know uh, what's on, uh, what's interacting with our um, infrastructure, our cyber terrain, whether it's supposed to be there or whether it's uh, adversarial activity. Um, that's where the network traffic analysis fits in. Obviously, um, if you have a threat hunting capability, um, you know, then we can provide uh, resources to those folks to uh, enable them to do that. I already talked about the sandboxing malware protection. Um, again, biggest differentiator in terms of what Fidelis does is we are a layer two to layer seven technology. Um, and what that means is we're looking at the entire TCP IP stack in terms of uh, the data on the wire and what's happening, not just um, up to uh, the session layer, not just NetFlow records, we're talking about uh, everything. So if somebody transmits you know, a zip file and that zip file has a, a PowerPoint and that PowerPoint references an Excel object, and that Excel object has VB macros, and those VB macros call PowerShell commands that you don't want running on your network, we're going to find that, right? And we're going to show it to you and we're going to say, hey, that PowerShell script, here's the MD5 for that. Maybe somebody else embedded it in something else. You might want to check to see if you've ever seen this anywhere else in the network. Is anybody else using this PowerShell script anywhere? Um, it's going to give you that ability to go back in time and say, hey, is this, you know, is this particular payload already detonated somewhere else in my environment? And this is just a new attack vector that I didn't know about? Or, you know, am I in the clear, right? There's nothing better than them being somebody, you know, showing up and saying, hey, this is the US cert and we've got this big challenge. Uh, you know, like we've had this, we've had several of these this year. Here are the IOCs. And you can plug those in, uh, if, if not through an automated th threat feed that does it automatically, you can say, I don't trust, you know, all of the, the machine stuff. I'm going to take that uh, MD5 hash, autophysics hash, that file name, uh, user ID, email address, domain, you name it, right? Whatever the ad attribute is, you can plug that into um, our collector and say, have we seen this object? And when it says no, you know, you have a really high confidence that you know you're not part of the uh, the campaign the the attack uh, profile that's uh, that's being reported so uh, you know allows you to go back to work and then work on uh, other challenges that you might have uh, any particular day so again really changes the game um, with regard to to how we do cyber defense uh, the endpoint EDR product um, again, agent-based uh, has threat intelligence has all the same capabilities um, definitely focused on, uh, you know, the giving the SOC, the enablement that they need to protect uh, endpoints in real time and be able to see those uh, wherever they are in the world, whether they're at Starbucks uh, headquarters uh, on a plane uh, or in a, a foreign country, right, where they may or may not supposed to be, depending on, you know, whatever happened, right, but maybe they just got a, their flight canceled because they weren't supposed to uh, be there and then, you know, pandemic hits and they're stuck. So, yeah, uh, wherever they happen to be, we can uh, see them, interact with them, uh, support them, um, and it's fully integrated with our uh, with our platform. 
Uh, having said that, uh, you know, there is a yet another agent problem. Um, changing out agents is challenging, especially in the EDR space. Um, so we do interoperate uh, our products. We interoperate today with uh, Sentinel One, Carbon Black, uh, and others, uh, McAfee. So if you have an endpoint solution and you want to kind of tie that together and make it easy, we've got those connectors and integration points already in the product. So um, not a challenge there, not a, a deal breaker if, uh, if you prefer to use somebody else's EDR um, capability, which is quite often the case uh, for a variety of reasons. Yes, sir, got a question for you. Sure. Um, what about mobile on that endpoint? I did not see anything in there. How do you handle mobile devices as part of the cyber, uh, cyberspace? Yeah, so we rely on um, we rely basically on other third party um, MDMs to to do that space. It's not a, a an area that we have focused on, to be honest. Okay. Yep. Thank it's you. Just, it's just uh, it's a very competitive environment, and so you got to pick your got to pick your uh, your uh, your uh, your targets. Um, in any event, uh, in the deception space, um, you know, again, whether you run our network product or not, you're going to get asset discovery and classification. Uh, you're going to get uh, the ability to deploy the decoys the way um, the way you want them. Um, you can automate that, right? That's the key here, right? So the old hunting grids, hunting nets, very manual, uh, highly resource intensive from a machine perspective, from a human perspective. Um, ran into some big challenges with uh, you know friendly fire in those types of environments where you have to keep them just as patched and secure as the regular operating systems, which makes it a much more challenging endeavor. Uh, we have come up with uh, automation and, and a product capability that does that uh, for our customers. Um, automating decoy distribution and making them change and agile and um, you know dynamic is important. Um, and ultimately, the goal is not to create um, a lot of activity. The goal is to create high fidelity alerts, right? So we have plenty of uh, alert fatigue issues out there. Uh, what we want to do is what we want to say is, hey, look, you know, when the adversary comes in and they manage to get through, they actually hit a decoy maybe instead of a real asset. Uh, if they do hit a real asset, we've got some things we can do in that regard. And if they pivot off that real asset, we're going to be able to detect them. The differentiator for deception uh, between others and, and ourselves is just the function of the fact that we have the network product and the ability to do that um, all ports, all protocol analysis and retrospective uh, forensics. So once an adversary knocks uh, on the, what I call the proverbial fake house that you put in the neighborhood to kind of lead the adversary away from, from your house with your TV, uh, when they show up on that, at that house and knock on the door to see if anybody's home to take the TV or the high value asset, the, the data, right? Then, um, then basically you can do the retrospective analysis. Say, okay, how did they get there? Where did they pivot from? Uh, did they rent a, an office, a, a room in a, in, a, in a house five, da, five, five doors down to keep watch uh, on the system for the last 30 days? How long have they been here? Uh, and what was their initial uh, attack uh, insertion point? Right? What, what, what actually allowed them to get through the defenses? So we can answer all of those questions in a couple queries. Um, and it's, it's very quick and, and point and click. When I say query, it's not, uh, it's not like writing scripts. Um, and I got the concept up there of uh, adaptation to, to talk to. So I think I've covered everything here. Um, one thing I should cover though is uh, the next, there are a couple other layers to deception uh, beyond the systems, which is um, the breadcrumb piece. So you actually deploy the breadcrumbs into your real environment. These are the proverbial passwords underneath the keyboard for, for timesheet, right? Nobody can remember their timesheet password and accounting makes you change it every 30 days. So you just write it down on a, on a post-it note so you keep track of it. We take those and we put those post-it notes out into the real environment. So here's the password for this system. Uh, here's the most recently used um, SSH access. Here's some web cache. Here's some um, emails. Uh, here's some NT share links. Um, and so we put these into the real environment, distribute those automatically. And so what that does is when the adversary does get to a real target uh, and they want to pivot, they're going to look for those opportunities to say, how do I fit in here, right? Or can I go that no one's going to say this is unusual, right? That's my, that's their, that's their objective typically. Um, and so uh, we have that addressed. Uh, we also uh, tie into Active Directory. So um, we install the machines in Active Directory, install fake users in Active Directory, and monitor the Active Directory to, to look at the usage. So if an adversary takes a, uh, a real credential, or I should say a fake credential, and tries to apply that to a real target, um, or a decoy, doesn't matter, but uh, you know it's obviously worse. They're taking a, a fake user and trying to use it against a, a real, uh, real asset in your environment. Um, we're going to go ahead and detect that and flag that as, um, as a decoy interaction that needs to be addressed because something is clearly amiss. Um, and so those are the other pieces of the puzzle and the deception uh, configuration piece uh, that, are, that are part of that solution. What does that look like? Uh, 
you know, it's about reshaping the attack surface, right? And so ultimately what we're doing here is, is we're uh, in, in one sense, in this sense, we are, in, we are taking uh, fake systems and fake users. We're applying that to the cyber environment. And we're dropping uh, breadcrumbs into the environment to tie all that together and, and link the emulated or the real OS decoys into uh, the real cyber terrain within your environment, keeping track of all of it, which is very important. Um, and perhaps adjusting it and making it more dynamic for, for more efficacy. But at the end of the day, um, there's nothing that prevents this, this from, from us deploying an entirely fake network, an entirely fake enclave uh, adjacent to, next to, routable through um, uh, the real cyber terrain. And so that can be in the cloud, that can be uh, in your data center, it could be a, a VLAN in an office building that's a high value asset, high value target. So um, completely fake area uh, as well. So it's not just fitting in within the existing terrain, it's again, creating targets of opportunity that the uh, adversary finds convenient and easy to use or try to uh, leverage for their means, uh, which again, changes the game on them as opposed to just uh, having their way with our, with our assets and our cyber terrain. Um, while we have an understanding of what our cyber train looks like at the same time, which is a, a huge win. Um, as we go into, as we talk about zero trust, I think that's going to be one of the biggest challenges. Um, configuration is going to be the challenge, understanding how all these systems that we have interoperate, communicate, can be or can't be micro-segmented to avoid self-inflicted denial of service, um, right? Those are going to be key challenges that we have to address. Um, and our network and deception products are really going to open the aperture on that and make it much easier for us to, to put that architecture in place and know that it's going to work with the confidence that our missions will not be disrupted as we do this process, um, which is, again, going to be a huge advantage. Again, key, di key differentiators, uh, terrain mapping, retrospective analysis, covered those pretty well. Um, threat hunting, if you've got those capabilities within your environment or want those capabilities, uh, we have a risk simulation capability, which is very, very cool from a perspective of, you know, having the conversations of, you know, how come the system is doing what it's doing and it's not protected better? Um, and here's what's going to happen if we don't get that uh, figured out. Ultimately, a little bumper sticker here, um, which I think applies. Uh, we spend uh, a lot of money left of, left of you know, the first, uh, the, the attack vector, right? So um, the adversary gets in and they have, they're able to move laterally, do their thing. We read about this every day. Um, and it's cheaper for them. Right, it's very cheap. Uh, the latest stat I have is ransomware as a service costs four hundred dollars. Right, so for us that's a huge bill, both on the upfront left side where we didn't catch it, and on the downside uh, where we got to uh, you know get our data back, restore it, recover it. Uh, you know, we don't pay ransoms anymore, hopefully. But at the end of the day, right, there's a lot of expense uh, for us and for the adversary. It's cheap and easy, um, and so if we can get them to have to spend some money, that changes their behavior. And changing their behavior should be part of part of our, our cyber defense posture. So we'll put that out there. Um, Halo. So this was the fourth thing. This is now the fourth pillar in our platform. So uh, we've already taken this and implemented it in the product. Um, and so what you get today is you get the ability to have um, a cloud security posture management service uh, running for your cloud assets. And that, in, that cyber terrain is mapped into your existing cyber terrain because ultimately uh, as far as I know, uh, for the most part, especially in our uh, in our business line here, you know, nobody's going directly to the cloud and, 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 and throwing a match behind with a, a couple gallons of uh, lighter fluid behind them and just burning it all down behind them. So ultimately, we're going to be going from, um, you know, we're going to have this hybrid capability of the on-prem and the cloud. Uh, we're going to have the dynamic workload. We're going to move workload back and forth. The pendulum's going to swing and we're going to decide some things can't be in the cloud where we have OPSEC reasons to not put things in certain places elsewise. And so ultimately there's always gonna be this sort of back and forth. And so being able to map the cyber terrain from cloud to on-prem or what your global context looks like is gonna be a key capability in terms of keeping track of all this stuff. And Fidelis is bringing that to the table. Uh, and we're doing that with some, some really robust um, methodologies, which we'll get to in the demo. Uh, you know, again, Halo use cases. Um, and, and this goes to some of the things I said earlier, cloud misconfiguration, uh, is going to be a challenge. Um, data loss and leakage, understanding our micro segmentation architecture, automatically remediating some of those things. That's uh, that's part of the the, the Fidelis Halo uh, story, and we'll have more to say about that. Micro segmentation is a key uh, is a key element uh, of, of that particular uh, aspect, and of course that fits into um, the zero trust architecture uh, model very well. 
ultimately, when you look at the Fidelis platform, then um, I really believe that the, we are uh, ostensibly foundational capability. So if you're, whether you already have tons of capability or you're just trying to figure out how you're going to reorient your, your architect, your cybersecurity posture and your, your architecture around that, um, we have a, a solution that's going to be able to uh, inform and really uh, drive uh, progress at a reduced cost ultimately to the enterprise. Um, so I think that's very important. The, uh, the everything we do, uh, I haven't mentioned this yet, so I'll say everything we do is mapped into the MITRE ATT&CK framework and labeled there. So if you're utilizing capability there or you want to utilize uh, our attribute uh, capabilities, um, everything in our platform is, is, uh, is built on an API that we use and publish. So uh, anybody who wants to come in and get data that we've collected uh, is welcome to do so. Uh, we can export data anywhere and you can reprocess it there. One of the things that I, I hope to make a key point today is, you know, um, as you take data from our system, uh, if it's interactive and API based and you're making decisions as a, as a policy decision point or policy enforcement point to do certain aspects of the architecture and you want our data to make some of those decisions, that's going to be available in real time. Uh, and if on the other hand, you want us to export that data out to data lakes, my, my only concern there over time has been that uh, it, it continues to be a reprocessing problem where you uh, takes time to do that reprocessing. So something to keep in mind as you're thinking about your cybersecurity architecture um, as a point of reference. The yellow things here on the, the wheel, just basically saying here are the things that we think um, you're gonna wanna have as part of your zero trust architecture. Advanced malware protection and digital forensics kind of fit into a, uh, a category that's not te technically um, uh, what I would say foundational to the zero trust architecture. Some of them are, in, are, in, are endemic, some of them are outsourced. Um, so however you wanna look at that, that's fine. But uh, these are some of the key capabilities um, that are going to fit into that uh, zero trust architecture. We've been doing this for a while, so we have a lot to, to offer there. and We'll get into that. In fact, more than I can cover today. So um, ultimately, a little bit uh, under the covers, uh, what does our network product look like? Uh, basically com comprises three components, comprise the solution architecture there uh, fundamentally. The sensor where we're doing all of the deep session inspection, heavy lifting, layer two to seven. Uh, this uh, capability is in line, uh, and it is also in 80% of the cases so far, it's uh, uh, integrated in an out of band capacity. Um, so more and more customers are moving to in line, and we have uh, we're shipping uh, uh, when we ship appliances. Uh, once you get above five gig, or you can do some load balancing with VMs if you want, but at a certain point, it makes more sense to use some commodity hardware. We're shipping with those uh, integrated decryption cards to do um, SSL TLS decryption. Uh, and monitoring, but we decrypt TLS, or I shouldn't say we decode TLS today. We keep track of the certificates, the cipher strengths, uh, and uh, other attributes that are available from the TLS session itself that can be tracked and used uh, for understanding uh, what's going on in the environment. Um, but if you want to get into the payload decryption business, then we can either provide that or we can take feeds uh, from, from different spaces. Ultimately, everything that's done in the green box uh, gets uh, transitioned over into what we call collector, which is our um, fully indexed uh, metadata repository. And from a uh, resource and, and uh, sizing perspective, the best thing I can tell you is that it's 97% more efficient than PCAP, right? Because we keep a copy of all the data that uh, we've generated as a function of doing all the things within the green layer. Uh, but uh, but in terms and, and the sessions, and I'll get into what that looks like in a minute. Um, but uh, it's very fast, it's fully indexed, it makes answering questions very easy, uh, point and click for, you know, a tier one analyst to come up with an answer of, you know, has this payload ever detonated in our environment? Yes or no, I need to know because otherwise we've got to shut the front door and shut the network down until we figure it out, right, based on uh, the uh, emerging threat scenario, right? So it can be very, uh, very timely. Command post is our UI, and that's again where the, uh, a lot of the uh, machine uh, pieces fit together from a from an analyst perspective, from a seam store architecture export perspective, et cetera. Uh, moving ahead, um, just one point, if you run a completely closed architecture as many of our government customers do, that's not a problem um, for us. Nothing uh, in our solution space requires access to the internet uh, whatsoever. Anything that uh, you'd like to get in terms of our threat intelligence, uh, product upgrades, uh, whatever, all that is sneaker net capable. We've built those integrations into the product today. So uh, there's no dependency or reliance upon uh, any sort of uh, open access to the internet and you don't need to share uh, any data with us to be fully mission effective with our product space. Um, so that's really the point of this slide. The other one is just to show the data lake there um, as well that, uh, that anything we're doing can be shipped off to, to other uh, systems for processing and correlation as well. Uh, sensors. So um, 
just keep in mind that if you're running at the you know 20, 50, 100 gig level, um, you know we have some certain capability in the in a hardware form factor to do that. Although all of these run as VMs um, and as uh, cloud-based uh, resources. Um, the thing that I want to point out here, most importantly, is that we offer mail and web sensors. And as we put the architecture together, I think mail is one of the, the pieces that uh, does not pop at people uh, when they think about um, the zero trust uh, model. So we're going to get back to that later. Uh, and the ICAP sensor, again, all of our decoding methodology is the same. We just put it in different form factors, which is huge. And our policy administration point is centralized. So our policies go across all the places we have sensing capability so that you don't have to rewrite policy for different use cases. Um, and that's a really going to be really important for uh, making a zero trust and efficient architecture to manage. Um, the, the fewer policies you have to administer, um, obviously the faster things are going to work um, and the more seamless they're going to work more consistently. Um, so for CASBs and other um, uh, SASE type solutions, um, you can tie in our ICAP sensor and you can again bridge that, I'll show it later, but you can bridge the uh, on-prem architecture and security posture to uh, externalized um, cloud-based security posture or private, whether it's a private data center, a hybrid environment, public, private, you name it, we can put it there. So um, we can adjust to that. Uh, again, visualization. So I think the important thing is most people don't take away from this idea that uh, the automation that goes into this, right? So people understand Wireshark, but the, you know, it's a very manual process. We actually do that sort of in the background and have that readily available for, for, uh, for query and introspection from an analyst perspective. Um, and, and it makes it easier to understand what's happening in the environment. That visualization is very important. Ultimately, leads to um, what I've been talking about, which is the power to answer questions, right? So who did what? When did they do it? How did they do it? Where did they come from? Um, and as you can see, here are some of the examples of the metro, the metadata that we're generating. We have the decoding path. We have the URLs that were involved, the user agents that, that activated the activity, the server uh, geography. Uh, server type, uh, all those types of things are captured. Anything that we can capture attribute wise off the wire, we're going to keep, store, and uh, make available for processing uh, at a fraction of the cost of PCAP uh, in terms of time and resources. Um, so very, very important uh, thing to keep in mind. Now, again, we can share all this data with anything. I and mean, anybody who wants to come in and query for this data through API interfaces is welcome to do so. So, um, so that's all built into the product and those interfaces are there today. Um, so as you get into thinking about policy decision points and where they're going to get their data and, and come up with criteria to uh, make decisions uh, for, say, ZTNA architecture, um, you know, that's, uh, we could be a data source that makes that um, very easy to do. Cyber terrain mapping. Yeah, so passive. So that's the big oh, difference man. between what we do uh, and what uh, other anyway. people do. Anyway, all right. So make so, this pretty. Anyway, so what I'll say is that, um, you know, when we're doing passive, we're going to have dynamic workload, right? Stuff is going to come and stuff is going to go. So we're going to pop into the printer, the, the print room. They're going to stick their, their home laptop because they didn't have time to grab their work laptop from their desk, you know, three halls down. And they didn't want to carry it out of the building anyway. So they're going to pop in there and print out some documents and, you know, boom, malware is in your environment that they brought from home. We're going to be able to see that um, activity and record it and uh, give you the insight on as to <clears throat> what that looked like and what that asset, where that asset showed up on the network and et cetera. Uh, just moving ahead really quickly, anomaly detection, uh, 50 different uh, uh, models, supervised and unsupervised, uh, are built into the analytics uh, that we provide. Uh, you're welcome to add more, uh, and um, they can be uh, fully, um, they, they will alert and create uh, activity uh, maps that will show you where things are happening that might be outside of the norm, um, which is going to be, you know, uh, an area of growth for all of us uh, in terms of automating uh, and keeping up with the sheer uh, breadth and depth of uh, the cloud. Um, zero trust architecture, just a quick point. We mapped uh, to the DOD uh, reference architecture, which maps uh, very closely to uh, the one that we're using in the working group, um, which is uh, on the next slide. So uh, that everybody's seen this one. And in terms of how we fit into this, uh, with all the capability that we're bringing, um, we're hitting 37 of the boxes with key core capability. Um, within the gray space, that's where we can add um, enhancement. Um, and so as uh, are, as you're looking at your security posture, as customers are, are trying to get wrap their hands around, okay, how am I going to buy 51 capabilities? Um, you really have to look at how can I how can I get the most bang for my buck um, ultimately. And so I think we have a very good story to say uh, on that, uh, as well as being able to tie in with the things you have on the orchestration and, and uh, API side of things. Ultimately, um, we do generate our own threat score, risk score, target valuation, et cetera, there on the bottom. Um, and so again, I think uh, cross cutting. 
uh, that's shareable and usable, reusable um, <clears throat> with other solutions that are that are being stood up for for doing these capabilities. Um, in terms of our pedigree, just uh, yeah, we have the, the various certifications and APLs. We're on CDM. Um, we are uh, the University of New Hampshire did our certification for IPv6. We have customers that are IPv6 only today, um, and they are using our products uh, in that environment, both from a management perspective and from a data uh, plane perspective. So, um, so I think that's a pretty pretty good thing to point out here as we are uh, dealing with mandates and architecture changes. Um, automation is the key. Uh, it's not always clear. Uh, where automation fits in or doesn't fit in. I think some people think that means, you know, the machines do think, but sometimes it just means that uh, that repetitive tasks that we ask our cyber analysts to do, uh, to do investigations, uh, to figure out where the data is, uh, we automate some of that stuff in the background um, and make it visible uh, at a at much faster um, uh, pace, if you will, bringing it up into, bubbling it up into the pane of glass that they need so that they're not uh, digging through um, the windows and clicks and depths and menus. Uh, searching for uh, the information that they ultimately need, um, which improves accuracy of detection overall and ultimately is um, the faster response thing is really important because while we'll build zero trust, it's it's going to be the case where the adversary is going to adapt. They're going to figure out uh, where the seams are, how to, um, they maybe, you know, we got to think about the idea that they're going to do more uh, social engineering to harvest credentials, um, encourage people who are uh, maybe not as happy in their their uh, their work life who want to share their credentials, um, you know, and so there there are going to be issues there, and so we have to be prepared uh, to defend against those types of attack vectors, um, which we've seen in the past, and we'll see them in the future. Um, just to kind of want to walk through um, as part of the the uh, zero trust um, requirements here. Uh, you know, what are you using? What are you showing? What are you doing? So. Uh, our Elevate architecture looks like this um, in the sense that uh, I've talked about command post and collector, the sensors we have. Um, uh, we will not be showing on-prem sandbox today, but I'm just showing that it does fit into the on-prem architecture. Deception is a server, uh, sits there, and then uh, you can have an ICAP server, your data lake, uh, wherever that happens to be, we can ship data there um, from the command post or from the collector as needed uh, to make, the, make that app. Cool. Um, obviously, if you have a capability and wants to tie in from an API perspective, they can make direct queries into uh, into our solution architecture here as well. So um, this is what on-prem looks like, generally speaking. Um, you've got perimeter gateways, you've got email servers, right? We've got cover down on all those spaces. Um, and then, you know, ultimately we're, we're going to be transitioning, or we already have, right? We should be transitioning to uh, cloud and, and zero trust, right? So basically our appliances ship as, uh, as I said, VHDs and AMIs, et cetera. Um, you can stand them up uh, and spin them up in your uh, cloud environments. And they tie back into your existing infrastructure. Right? So if you have command posts and you want to put, uh, you know, a mail sensor in the cloud, but you don't, you know, take it off-prem, you can do that. If you want to uh, have a deception in the cloud, um, right, it all can talk centrally back to, it's not a separate architecture for different architectural experiences. Um, it's just about putting the right capability in place. Um, and from a licensing perspective, we're subscription-based, which means we have a lot of flexibility in terms of how those assets are deployed um, and uh, also how they're managed. And so, um, it's not a. It's not quite the uh, the expense profile of all the boxes you see on the screen. I just want to kind of point that out. Uh, what we're providing today is we're going to be looking at. Uh, you know, we're going to be providing insight. We're providing, um, which is our threat intelligence feeds. Uh, we have the collector stood up. Um, everything's running a VM uh, on a single server today uh, for this demo. Um, Fidel's command post is out there. We have direct sensor. We have an internal sensor actually, uh, which is the same as a direct sensor. We have Fidel's mail sensor uh, running against. Um, mail transactions. Uh, our mail sensor is um, ostensibly an MTA, but it can also run in uh, Milter mode, um, and it can also run in BCC mode um, if you have different uh, security postures you want to use around email, as opposed to putting us into the uh, the MTA, the transfer chain between uh, different systems. Uh, totally up to you, but uh, but we do fit in all those different, with that flexibility. Uh, deception, we just want a lot of that. Okay, and I do actually have a slight demo on um, doing a data lake transfer. So we'll get to that hopefully too, uh, with the time we have remaining. So um, we're gonna do questions at the end. So I'm just gonna keep going uh, today. Um, and we're gonna get into the interactive part of the demo and uh, you know, it's a live demo. I'm gonna try to do that today to, to make sure that uh, we can reveal the fact that it's uh, it's not smoke and mirrors. Um, and I'll do a quick, uh, quick demo here. Um, and it's gonna require a couple of screens, so bear with me. Um, so ultimately, um, let's look at, yeah, of course, I'm sorry. Yeah, the timeout's working. 
Um, let's look at and do a little bit of overview um, from a command post perspective, what the analyst sees. Um, and so we have our MITRE ATT&CK dashboard coming into the office this morning. We seem to be doing better today than we were yesterday on uh, some things to the left side of the attack stage. We got some uh, new uh, evasion techniques showing up. Um, and again, uh, overall command and control, those are the places we're gonna wanna put resources today to figure out what those things are about um, and what's going on with those. And I would just click this uh, and it will take me into those alert profiles. Um, in terms of cyber terrain, I said this is very important. I think it is. Um, this is what our environment looks like uh, from a, a you know an inventory perspective. We can uh, export this out. We can save it to a file. Um, can see where the attack uh, framework fits in with what we're seeing. Um, can overlay that, uh, and ultimately, um, you know, we have some visibility into uh, what kind of operating system and devices we have. Versus um, green is ours, by the way. Um, everything in the environment, uh, and uh, the blues are where we have uh, endpoint uh, deployed. Gray is where we have decoys and uh, decoy uh, capability deployed. So you'll see those guys down in here in the little jackets. Um, we also expand out uh, what those servers do and services that we see them doing in the environment. Um, so we can uh, we can see that type of information. We can also tag important assets, um, and we can see where we have uh, endpoint agents deployed uh, on our systems. In terms of subnet architecture, we can see all the subnets and where assets are located and what their attack profile looks like, um, or attack not, I uh, shouldn't say that, their threat profile, risk profile is red here. There's a lot, uh, risk is 10, there's a lot of bad things happening in the, in the demo environment. The domains that we've seen on the network, one way or the other. Um, operating systems, obviously, uh, vendors, roles, of, uh, roles is kind of cool. So we can see roles, um, different types of IDs. So this is, this is all just show and tell. Um, ultimately, uh, that gets down to um, one other thing that I, that I like to show just in terms of some things that come up sometimes is we can look at HTTP tools um, and we can just to see how fast this is, uh, right? We can see versions of Microsoft bits. I like this one because this was an FBI all not last year um, where if you had a version less than 7.8, they wanted you to fix it right away um, because it turned into a command and control vector for the adversary. But um, in any event, uh, we can see those assets that have the right version. We can see assets that have the wrong version. Uh, so we know where to maybe put our assets to it. Uh, just a different way to look at the challenges on the network um, that might be popping up and a sense of the speed of which the, the system works. Uh, we do map vulnerabilities um, within the architecture, uh, which is just get rid of this. Um, and so, uh, so we have our own vulnerability management capability. Um, we can uh, take imp import inputs from uh, your active scanning uh, solutions to improve our visibility. We can also export this out to those and they can, they can use the information there as well. So it's a two-way street, depending on how you want to do vulnerability management, but we're collecting it um, and it can be used elsewise. We also apply these on the decoy layer, um, which I think is important to note. Um, we'll actually drop uh, um, uh, these types of uh, vulnerability into the decoys to interact with the various tools that the adversary may use so they get the responses that they expect to get uh, when, they, when they engage. Communications mapping um, is, uh, is again, a visibility tool. You can get to this in a couple different ways. I just clicked on it. Um, I will show this uh, for the sake of overview. Uh, if I go into an asset, um, I can show you know what, I, what it's talking to, uh, how it's uh, interacting with the environment, but I can also I run a red team simulation on it. And uh, with that, I can figure out if this asset is going to be a bigger problem if the adversary gets to it. Yeah, a couple of clicks into the attack cycle and we think they're gonna own a large majority of these systems pretty quickly. So in terms of keeping the system protected, um, that could be a good thing and an easy conversation to have internally to say, okay, here's how we think the adversary is gonna move in the environment if we don't take care of this system. Um, so again, could be useful for a variety of use cases in the zero trust architecture space. Okay, so um, the other thing that we are running today, uh, so I should point this out, um, is we are uh, running our endpoint uh, solution here. So I'll just go ahead and um, kind of demo that very quickly uh, in my way of overview. <clears throat> um, and uh, it is a, I'll go into behaviors really quick. Um, and then we'll show, we can show process, network file, everything that we're seeing in the environment we can search and query for. Um, if you look at process in the last hour, just to give you some sense of uh, what we're processing there. Um, we don't have a lot of endpoints running, but you can see all the different uh, services and executions that they're doing. 
uh, and you can drill into those if you wanted to from a forensic perspective, if you were that uh, so, so engaged uh, as an analyst. Um, on our endpoint side, uh, just three endpoints running for simplicity, Linux um, and uh, two Windows systems uh, generating activity, as well as uh, I can see what's installed on those systems. Uh, and we also have uh, which is software inventory, again, cyber terrain, as well as a live access so I can actually um, connect into these systems remotely. Um, and anywhere in the world, even at Starbucks, um, if I had the, uh, if I had some intentionality around a particular issue that I was having, right, I can, uh, I can get onto that system and I can start, under, you know, doing some triage um, uh, as a, uh, as a cyber analyst if I had to. So, um, so a little bit of a reverse shell, if you will, but, um, but effective. Okay, so with all of that, um, I'm going to pivot into the more active demo. This is kind of the overview. And what I want to take you into is a little bit of understanding on the deception side, some things we've done. So we have some decoys in the environment here, uh, running various uh, systems and uh, types, right? So I've got a Linksys router, I've got a workstation with a bunch of services open. Um, and I've also got credentials and I've uh, populated these into Active Directory as well. And so um, I have those capabilities there. And I'm going to use Kelly here as an example. Um, that's her password in case you wanted to know. Um, and so I'm going to use her for uh, the live demo. So let's go over and, and, and look at how this works from a, from a demo perspective. And I'm going to pivot into alerts over here. Uh, and this is around identity and access management, right? So got a couple things going on. Uh, let's see if anything else going on in the last hour. Good, nothing, that's amazing. All right, so let's go over. So um, I'm gonna do a little, uh, we're gonna assume that uh, somebody has Kelly's uh, credentials, um, has stolen them, obtained them from their keyboard, uh, popped our Active Directory and, 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 and captured those. And so we're going to try and log in as Kelly, see if we can get access to the things we want in the environment. And it really doesn't matter what password I use because that's not gonna work. So there we go, that did not work. So um, I'll do it one more time just for fun. Maybe I typed it wrong. Okay. So with any luck being a live demo, this may take a bit, but we'll come back to that. Um, so, so that's the first thing. The other thing that we should look at while that's processing, uh, it may take a, up to a minute depending on timing, um, is we'll go ahead and look at the network metadata piece. And so what I want to show here from a demonstration perspective is we talked about a lot of things that we capture in the attributes. So if you just look at um, application users, authentication types, authors, uh, certificate risk score, you know, a lot of different things that we're picking up out of the environment. Um, I'm going to just keep going on and on here. Um, you can even pull event tags, things we've tagged, things we've tagged with MITRE technique. Uh, functions and analytics uh, that we pulled up um, based on uh, decoding and analyzing all of the traffic on the network. Um, in our particular environment here, uh, today we look at uh, last 24 hours. Go ahead and pull metadata first. Um, oops. Always got to click our right place. So um, in the last 24 hours, uh, we've processed 2 million transactions on the network. It's not a very large network, but there's a lot of activity uh, nonetheless. And then we can see uh, the types of activity that have propagated across the network in that time. Uh, we can also see uh, the files that have been transferred, right? I can dig into these if we wanted to, um, you know, or we can exclude them and say, yeah, I can't do anything with the binary ones right now. And it's not really what I'm looking for. So let's exclude those. Um, so that's how that works. Um, and again, it's all you know, cut our transactions down to half. Uh, could, uh, let's see, we'll just, just to give you some idea. Meanwhile, back in the Hall of Justice, um, we can see that uh, twice uh, we have a failed credential alert. So somebody has taken credentials and tried to use the decoy credentials to authenticate to a real asset in my cyber terrain. Uh, and just to prove putting put proof in the pudding uh, see my domain controller and reporting that kelly woods uh, failed to get into the domain using key per kerberos pre-authentication so um so just a quick and easy demo uh to go over kind of how that works talk about the fact that you know we're not going to just put out uh, decoys out there and hope for the best we're actually going to keep track of what's happening 
Uh, we're going to come back to that. Um, but that's just one example of how the system works. Um, so moving forward then with the, uh, let me come back to the slides for a second. We've taken a look at Kelly, we've taken a look at some metadata. Let's talk about a real cyber, cyber uh, attack uh, situation scenario, right? So uh, if any of you have followed up on, or been watching this, um, ESXi uh, VMware has become a, a target of uh, various cyber criminals because it's a it's a easy um, it's an easy win for them, frankly. Um, so uh, in this particular case, uh, a couple months ago, it was reported that this this took place. And what's important to note is that the intruders gained access to the network by logging into a TeamViewer account, right? Uh, and that the attackers used advanced IP scanner to target attacks and find the ESXi server, uh, and then they they went after it. Um, right and and got into it. So at that point, let's let's just uh, let's just work it from there. So from a uh, bear with me here. From a how does this work perspective, we'll use our uh, blue pill red pill guy. We'll just pretend that uh, VNC is Team Viewer, okay? Um, and so uh, we'll do something challenging here. I'm going to I've already downloaded my advanced IP scanner tool, uh, but I haven't installed it yet. I've got access to the system. I'm the, in the adversary here, right? So I've penetrated. I've figured out that this thing is just sitting here open to the world. I can access it. I'm going to have some fun with these guys, right? So I'm, getting, I'm doing the same TTP as the adversary, right? I'm even going to run the portable version, right? So accept the license agreement. So um, we're getting here. Boom. I'm up and running, right? This is cyber time. This is how long it takes the adversary to execute their mission, okay? Once they get in, so we'll go ahead and we'll uh, we'll launch the scan in the environment. Um, this will take a, a minute or two. Um, so with that in mind, let me go over while well, that runs in the bank. You can see it's already propagating information. Um, we'll go over and we'll look at uh, the anomalies that we can produce uh, out of this environment. Um, there'll be very few because it's pretty small, but at the end of the day, um, they are all clustered into various groups. You can break that down into more granularity. Uh, and then you can see up here, the family names are things like analytic events, logins, endpoint events, uh, and such. So we've got various models against uh, various types of activity that we can be tracking on the endpoint side or on the network side uh, for, for doing this type of analysis. Um, so we'll just cover that as part of the demo. Well, pretty much getting almost done. So they ran their thing. Let's see, they're looking for ESO. Oh, look, they found, we found an ESXi server. Fantastic. Now, here's the bad news and I'll show you why. Um, bear with me. Okay, so um, the shell service is important. Sorry. So the shell service is not running on my ESXi server. So darn it all, I'm not gonna be able to go after them with this particular attack vector. However, let's take a look at uh, something on the alert side. Oh boy. I have a whole bunch of decoys that have been accessed from somewhere in the system. And if I look at this, it looks like they're all associated with this one IP address uh, who ran all these attack vectors. Okay, we can dig into that. Um, we can start looking at all these things. But at the end of the day, I now know that I have this asset, which is instrumented with my uh, endpoint, by the way. So we'll get back to that. Um, I have this attack vector. Um, and I know that somebody has played with my decoy server. So here's the thing. They spent the next three hours after discovering what they wanted to do, coming up with their, their attack solution, right? And going after it. But if I'm the cyber defender, I already know they're there. I'm not gonna give them three hours, right? I'm gonna have, the system is gonna have taken these alerts, passed them along to the SIEM, the SIM, an email message, uh, to my cell phone that's going to start my S that's going to an SMS server that's going to send me a hey we got problems on the network that we want to you know they're urgent you can do all of those different things we're now riding uh, in parallel with the cyber attack timeline right we're not finding this out the next day we're not waiting to find out that uh, the log files on the SXI server showed somebody logged in who shouldn't right? days later so so that's what we're doing right so we've now uh, tripped up the adversary in essence. Uh, so that while they're doing their thing, we're, we're going after them. So they take three hours. So let's look at what we can do in the next couple of minutes. Um, so one of the things that I've done, uh, one of the things that we'll see in here, I think, is um, they've also 
done me a favor and found an unauthorized internal web server, which is kind of interesting. So um, that happens to be this uh, 101. So if I went to the 101 asset information, I would find that web server I know it was there, um, but I haven't put it into the environment variables of the product to say that this is somewhere that should people should be regularly browsing on my network. Um, and so with that, if I find those things, I've created a playbook uh, in my environment that says, if you find an unauthorized internal web server, I want you to um, I want you to run a who's currently logged into that system uh, and run that question. And so it's going to do that. And so what you'll see up here is uh, look at that and ran that uh, recently. So we can highlight, and I can run over to um, the task results. I can say, show me the result. With any luck, it says Neo was logged into that system. That's great. And while we're here, let's see what else Neo is doing on the system that it's apparently attacking my, uh, my network. Um, sorry, let's go into behaviors. And we'll see what kind of processes have been run in the last hour. Oh, look, advanced IP scanner was run and I alerted on it, right? So even just the act of downloading and installing uh, the, the attack vector actually set up an alert that was probably exported out and I got on my cell phone at two in the morning to say, somebody's doing some things you don't wanna be doing. This is out of the box. I didn't, didn't have to program this. This is a, a natural detection. Um, and so, so those are the types of things we're going back and forth on. Um, and then, you know, what I want you to understand, this all seems like a lot of things going on but it's the automation behind it, right? So it's not finding the logged in user that was important there. What I wanna show you is how this ties into tipping and queuing back and forth across a dedicated platform. So if I go in and I look at um, unauthorized folder login here, I ran a job to say, tell me who the logged in user was, which is recorded down here in the alert workflow, we keep track of the things that we do in response to alerts, what the system does in response to alerts or what users do in response to alerts. I also um, show that here, right? Currently user logged in via playbook, right? But I can also, I didn't have to run who's logged in. I could have run, you know what? Turn that box off, right? This works in Starbucks. It works on the moon, right? I can take control of that system and say, only I can talk to that system until we figure out what this guy's doing. He's not gonna be running any ransomware scripts on my network until I figure out what the heck this is all about. And I can run any script from here. These are the manual functions. I'm hoping that you're making the under the leap, the logical leap between what we can do, what I didn't show because I didn't really want to turn off my VNC viewer uh, and that particular adversary. So, um, so that automation all happened in real time as a live demo, no, no smoke and mirrors. That's how we operate. Um, let's take the attack vector a little bit further though. So I can't do my ESXi attack. So hmm, I wonder if they got any, oh, look, they got FTP running. That's fantastic. Let's see if I can get into an FTP server. I can't run ransomware. So um, maybe what I'll do is uh, I'll run, um, your name would be, oh, I wonder if I can use Kelly and get in this way. Oh, excellent. It worked. Um, so maybe I'll just run some, I run download my uh, tools here. Maybe I can just do some crypto mining in this environment, take advantage of it that way. So I'll go ahead and I will download this into their my documents folder. I'll transfer some files over there, right? I'll get ready to do my pivots and figure out how I'm going to take advantage of that. Maybe I'll download that from a couple of the systems I find on the network. Um, okay, so we'll do that. Meanwhile, and this may take a minute, so we'll just go over and look at it for a second. Timing is good. So we'll go into alerts. And see what's happened on all things recently. Oh, look, malware Trojan, malware Trojan and malware commercial. Two files I just uploaded. So let's look at that. So the nice thing about this is this has already been done. This took a couple seconds, right? Now we've seen the, uh, we've seen this malware before. So that's the reports cached. So we just send the sandbox report right back to the user from the cloud, right into the system, give them all the details they need. This can be shared uh, 
with uh, forensics folks. Um, if you're a cyber analyst and you wanna see what things this thing did, you can get into that from reporting functionality. So all that is, is already there, it's already done. Um, and uh, there's some endpoint tasks that are happening to validate the transaction. But at the end of the day, I can see who tried to do it, what they, how they did it, and what the decode path was. I can download from right here, the actual executable. I don't have to run a script. I don't have to go to the box. I don't have to roll a truck. Um, I can get the executable here if I wanted to. I could do it from endpoint and pivot over there for as well. Um, I can see the forensic data around the session of the transfer, right? There's the, uh, the MS-DOS program uh, and uh, some more information about that. So a lot of information available immediately to, um, to, the, uh, to the attacker uh, or to the cyber defender. I've also got an MD5 and a SHA-256 hash. So let's pivot to these and see if these have been running around in the network anywhere else. just for grins and giggles. Um, and hopefully many people are taking away the fact that this is a, and there's an alert, a red is our alert function here. Um, and so uh, taking away from the fact that this is all point and click enabled, right? Um, we have some very good metrics from our customers. Um, they take their, their, their folks, they send them to cyber weapons school, they put them in front of this console, they give them a mission and say, this is your, this is your TTP, your con ops. And within four hours, they're basically mission effective. Um, huge win, right, from the training side, uh, because it's all point and click. There's no scripts to learn. There's nothing that you, uh, that you really need to know in order to operate a Fidelis solution. Um, so in the last seven days, uh, this particular artifact has been flying around on the network. Um, I've been playing with it, obviously. Um, and so the good news is my attack vector is limited to these three hosts, which is one of them is my decoy. Uh, actually, two of them are my decoys, and one of them is the uh, is the victim machine that I've been using. So I only have to rep, I only have to remediate my victim machine, uh, and I've done, and it's been transferred over FS7B and uh, uh, the FTP and file type is executable. I could even drill into this. Um, I can see the details here. I can also see the, uh, the decoded uh, information here about the transfer. So again, these are the metadata attributes that were collected for all time and can be replayed. Okay, so we've done all of this. Um, I haven't even gotten into, you know, we can see this from a different view, uh, deception activity. Um, I think many people are probably getting the idea here. Um, we also have a function called conclusions, which takes all the alerts that we generate and boils it down into um, specific uh, events. You can also see that uh, in this view. Um, so if cyber analysts would prefer not to have to deal with the single alerts like we've been doing today, um, we can actually jump in and we can see various alerts over the timeline uh, that are all associated. So I now have, you know, four alerts or one function and I can go deal with this one problem instead of thinking it as four different issues. Um, and then that gets even better uh, if you've got uh, file folder manipulation here. Um, you can see 1,843 alerts over time. Um, and the, 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 uh, some of the details around that and the passwords that were used uh, to try and access that account. Um, so it's gonna be very effective in terms of forensic analysis and giving the, average, giving the cyber defender the ability to move quickly uh, within the, uh, the cyber speed timeline of actually prosecuting an attack vector. Okay, uh, I have a couple other things um, to show real quick and tie this all together about 12, uh, Kirsten said 10 minutes, I think we can get it done. So let's see if we can do this. So um, solar winds, obviously we all know about this. One of the, one of the um, IOCs is this particular domain. Um, so if that were to come out today, if this was all to be brand new, if this was December 17th, 2020, let's look at um, you know, how does that work uh, and with Fidelis sitting out there doing its job. Um, we're gonna just drop back into network metadata and uh, for the sake of time, uh, I'll just go back to here. Uh, let me see. I dropped that in there and it didn't come back to the domain. It's checking today. Let's see what comes back. So it'll take a couple seconds. Catch a, catch a breath anyway, so this will be good. The last thing that we're gonna to talk to is a little bit of DLP action uh, around uh, the mail sensor. So a little preview of what's coming. Um, actually, let's, uh, I think because we're doing all activity, it's gonna take a few more minutes, but um, 
I should have clicked it this way. So we'll just bypass this and we'll go look at uh, go look at this a slightly different way. So oh, disappeared. Okay. Um, so in the advanced section, we'll go into uh, domain name. Now this is obviously um, doing it manually, right? So um, ideally uh, you would do this. Um, so good. So it says no data found on that. If I didn't spell it wrong, uh, let's go back and check. Oh, that's because it's an equal sign, my bad. Uh, and apply. Uh, if this was threat intelligence, this would be done automatically in the background. We would alert on it um, if it was coming in through an automated feed from from US CERT or whatever. So this is the the analyst checking to see uh, if we've ever had this type of activity on the network, and darn it all, we have, right? And so uh, we can see that over the timeline um, where that's occurred. Uh, I can get more specific about um, you know what's come back uh, in this regard um, over time, and uh, let's see, this is endpoint response. Just take a look at the details here. And so came back with no answer because it's a, uh, oh, look, it is C name is the record type. Um, the domain is now protected from this type of uh, adversarial activity. Um, and so nothing's gonna, gonna come back here, but uh, that's uh, an, under, an idea of how fast you can pivot from a, a threat indicator to understanding whether you've got issues in your environment or uh, if you don't, right? Like if uh, you did this query over the last hour and it came back with no transactions and that was all the data we had available, you know, you proved a negative, right? You don't have this attack vector. You can go about working other issues that uh, that you want to get done that day or maybe having a cup of coffee and taking a break. Um, all right, so uh, data loss prevention and <clears throat> zero trust. Let's talk to that. All right, so uh, this demo is going to be a little bit different. Um, go down here, talk about 94% of all malware is delivered by email. So kind of a, kind of an important point. We've got to deal with the, got to continue to deal with mail. There's a lot of mail solutions out there. There's a lot of uh, MTAs um, and, you know, it's still getting through, right? So where Fidelis fits in is we become part of that chain. We apply all of our, our technology to a mail and, um, and we're good at it. So uh, with that in mind, I want to go ahead and uh, pull up uh, my mail host, and we'll go ahead and we'll run a few emails. And I can even send this to a real domain. Box, this is the memo we need for a meeting. Hello. You've seen all the alerts today, so we know that the uh, this is not going to be anything new. We're going to hit send. Uh, I'm going to say something, and it's out the door. Uh, okay, so uh, we'll just see. I'm just curious. Okay, we'll get that in a second. So under uh, back in uh, alert land here, um, go ahead and sort by alert time. Oh, look, DOD classified in memo.docx. Hmm. Wow, that's not good. There's the decode path, SMTP, MS Word came from, came through the SMT protocol to my internal host for processing. Um, so we can go ahead and you can see the attack vector is changing on the top of the screen there, the reload. Um, DOD markings were found. Oh, okay, well, I know what that means. So we'll go ahead and we'll look. Um, here's the email and the headers, right? We don't have to go pull the email message. I can even pull the word document out. Um, I'm not a classification authority, so you'll notice I use the lorem ipsum, right, with my document to make sure that it wasn't uh, anything germane. Uh, but anyway, point is, um, if we want to find CUI, CTI, uh, straight old classified, uh, other markings that we need to find, data tags that do or shouldn't exist in certain places, or that don't exist at all. If the document comes through with no data tags, I can reverse the logic and say if the data tag blah, blah, blah does not exist in documents coming from these spaces, then it should be something else. So um, so there you go, data loss prevention. 
uh, in um, uh, in a zero trust environment using email. Uh, meanwhile, back in my mail client, um, just for fun, um, memo doc was detected in your email and it's been quarantined pending authority review and release. And if you believe this message has been, please contact the help desk at you gotta be kidding me.com. Okay, so um, last thing uh, to wrap it up, um, we can take any questions that people may have, um, but this comes up every once in a while. So um, let's go ahead and uh, with the warnings here. I haven't totally secured this, but people ask, you know, can you share this data with other things? What happens with that? And uh, just a couple of minutes ago, uh, November 19th, 1209, right? There was an email that got sent. Uh, we need this for meeting, right? So I've already sent this off to Elastic and it can be reprocessed all you want. If you want it to be Splunk, Q Radar, ArcSight, uh, whatever, whatever preference you have in terms of uh, making sure that the data is available for um, processing, post-processing, whatever, uh, we'll make that available. Uh, with uh, everything you have in the product, you got to set this side up. Um, but, uh, and that's a lot of heavy lifting to generate the dashboards and whatever, but there you go. So um, that's it. Uh, that is uh, everything we wanted to cover today. Uh, live demo went pretty well and I'll take any questions that people have. Yep. If anyone has questions, we have five minutes until we see our next demonstration. So uh, please ask them, you can put them in the chat. Can or, we, yeah. Can we speak them? Oh, good. Thank you. Sorry. <laughs> Hi, Mari. Yeah, thank you, Kirsten. Hi. Um, so, uh, Robert, magnificent, magnificent tool and concept. Um, uh, did I hear right? I missed some of the uh, meeting. Did I hear right? It's offered as a service, so I don't necessarily need to deploy anything in my environment. I can sort of put um, maybe even direct traffic um, to your system. Yeah, so um, so you can, um, you know, we are uh, software as a service model. We have a um, licensing is subscription and or perpetual, depending on how you want to do this. So, um, so yeah, there's there's a variety of different ways we have for our commercial customers. Uh, we have cloud enabled um, capability, right? That we uh, that we deploy, and then it's just about getting the sensor into the data path. So wherever you can put our sensor, uh, even if it's in the cloud and outside the data path, like a mail sensor. Uh, just part of the MTA chain. Uh, there's just there's there's a lot of flexibility. It, it really it's a lot easier to answer if we can just uh, I mean not easier to answer, but you know the architecture uh, makes more sense when we have a chance to just throw it at a whiteboard and say this is what I've got. What do you want to do with it? Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions before we tee up microfocus? Well, I'll just say uh, thanks everyone again um, before we run out of time and uh, appreciate uh, appreciate your help, Kirsten, today and uh, everybody coming along for the ride uh, that we had. Thanks, Robert. Um, it's a great presentation. Yep. Fantastic. Um, uh,